What we're talking about is Henrik Ibsen's A Doll House, or A Doll's House, depending on how you translate. Um, this play is super important to theater scholars. It's probably the most written about play other than Shakespeare plays. And it really is particularly significant because of what Ibsen does towards the end. But I'm not going to do a spoiler alert for you. Um, and also to really understand how this play becomes revolutionary. Um, I'm, I'm going to withhold information. <laughs> so, um, Adol, well, Henrik Ibsen is Scandinavian, um, Norwegian, and um, he, he was already kind of a renegade in the theater, but there was a reason for that, and it was the time in which he was writing. Um, there was a lot going on in the late 19th century when he wound up writing A Doll's House. Um, we know this to be kind of the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. So there are a lot of people have moved into cities because, you know, factory culture is pervasive. We're not living in fiefdoms anymore. We're not um, primarily an agricultural society. We're not just craftsmen. Now people are working in the factories, right? We have the age of mass reproduction. And so this is when cities rise in prominence and importance in, um, in Western culture, um, both in the United States and in Europe. Um, this really has a profound effect on society. I mean, you can imagine. You go from an agrarian culture to an urban culture. And we hadn't been doing it for very long. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of changes in the way that we lived. And in some ways, the velocity in, in which this, this change happened was so fast that we didn't even get to process how it was affecting humankind and the way that we lived and the, the, the way that we thought as a result. Um, so modernism 101. Many of you probably know the term since you go to an art school. But modernism is not only an artistic movement, but it is a cultural movement. It is a philosophical movement. I mean, it's, it's one of the most uh, distinct movements in human history. And it starts in the late 1800s, um, has kind of a second wave during World War I, and then ends uh, right around World War II. So Ibsen's play is written in what we call first wave modernism. There was a lot of things that were happening at this time. Um, obviously, the Industrial Revolution being one of them. But there were a couple other things, and in particular, some publications that came out. One was Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Um, this comes out in the 1850s. Now, you probably are familiar with Darwinian theory, the idea of survival of the fittest. This is a brand new theory, you all. It, it kind of purported evolution instead of creationism, and, and basically said that animals evolve um, in order to improve what we call their fitness or their ability to procreate and to survive. So this was revolutionary, right? People had probably been thinking or at least being skeptical about religious authority, and they had been since the Renaissance, but this was a scientific document that was arguing that the creation myth was not create, uh, correct, which was still accepted by the majority. And, and then all of a sudden there's a scientific explanation for all of the cosmos, um, in particular biology, and that all creatures, including human beings, which is suggested in the book, evolve and obviously are not... Um, created out of something pure and then unchanging, right? So this supported an idea that religious law was not accurate and also contributed to one of the precepts of modernism that's super important to understand, which is 
There is no absolute truth in the, in the universe. Um, this is a brand new idea. The fact that this philosophical precept was being um, perpetuated in intellectual circles in the 19th century was, I mean, in and of itself revolutionary. We are still riding that coattail. We, uh, in postmodernism, which is what we're in now, um, or arguably what we're in now, we, we still have adopted this idea that there is no absolute truth, that there are multiple truths, right? But in modernism, they weren't really focused on the multiple narratives. They were just so thrown and inspired by the idea that there wasn't an absolute truth. This is something that had existed in the West since the dawn. Um, and this shatters the notion of reality and human life among, among citizens and denizens of the cities and the countryside. It, it really does get into everyone's home, um, which all major theories, they take a while to do. And this was done mainly because there were advances in technology, right? We now have, you know, the concept of the telephone and um, telegram and just we're traveling faster. Um, our ships have gotten better. We're, we're being exposed to a lot more things and um, we had developed a very good postal system. And, you know, so ideas can spread faster. Um, and that's the reason why this idea of there is no absolute truth becomes more pervasive. Um, and Darwin's On the Origin of Species is one of those texts that contributes to this idea on a mass scale. Another one, you might know this guy too, his name is Sigmund Freud. Um, Freud, even though he's rather unpopular in some ways today, kind of revolutionized the way that we thought about the psyche. Um, he brought in the concepts of the id, the ego and the superego, and also that human nature, this is what's more important to understand in order to really get what a doll's house is doing. But Freud said that there is no absolute law to human nature. So once again, inspired by this philosophic precept that we don't have, you know, an authoritarian creation myth, an absolute truth about what humanity is and what the world is, he is contributing in a psychological way as opposed to Darwin's scientific way. And so the combination of those two texts and just how um, much they influence intellectual life in Europe and, and to a lesser degree in the United States inspires artists. Artists start to ask, like, well, what is truth? And if art is supposed to tell the truth, well, then what are we supposed to write about? <laughs> so there is this happening, okay? In addition, under a lot of monarchical rule, and remember that we're starting to change out of monarchies. We're just beginning to form democracies and republics and, and political um, systems that aren't built on this idea that one person is promised to be the great authority, right, through birthright. Well, you can imagine that in the monarchical system, someone born into the, the authority is also associated with wealth and riches, and so that naturally is associated with this idea that being wealthy was a virtue, that somehow just by being wealthy, you are a more virtuous um, entity. You are a more virtuous creature, a more virtuous citizen. But because that was being shattered by all of the, the political dimensions um, and political revolutions inspired by yet another writer, Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, May, many of you probably know that one as well, all of a sudden artists weren't very interested in presenting just the upper class perspective, the privileged perspective. And what we see in theater is that there was a shift away from just writing plays about kings and the aristocracy and the tribunals. Think about all the plays that we've, we've read. All of them involve 
people of upper class, right? A higher status. Well, in a doll's house, you're going to actually see it's just a middle class family. This is the very first time we see this. Um, artists now have more interest in depicting everyone, not just <clears throat> the aristocracy, but even prostitutes and the homeless and the working class and the middle class. All of a sudden, everyone now has a perspective. And so during the modernist era, in painting, in, in literature, and certainly in theater, we're going to see a lot more of the common person being represented, um, as is the case in a doll's house. And also, because of the industrial age and because of how quick it came upon people and, and how much velocity it just um, ushered in with change, there's also this fascination with artists to depict how this new urban life has affected um, people's psyche, um, the family structure, value systems, and in particular, the individual. Um, so you're going to see that as well in this play. All of these things, Karl Marx's socio-political theory, um, Freud's psychological theories, and um, Darwin's scientific theories, coupled with what has been happening in society and this move to urbanization, all of these things really impact artists. We see a very, very distinct change in aesthetic because of all of these influences. Art is no longer made to demonstrate this glorious truth. And instead, it becomes more interested in documenting all the other stuff that art was never documenting. The poor, the downtrodden, disease, all these things that were just never exhibited otherwise. It makes for very psychological complex um, compositions in art, in, in literature, for sure. We finally, for the very first time, have a first-person narrative, um, and we have the novel um, as a concept. Like, these things emerge during this period because we don't need this absolute narrator anymore, this omniscient narrator. And then, of course, in theater, we have very well-drawn, complex, individual characters. So it's going to be very different than the stock character um, circumstances of Moliere's Tartuffe, for example. Um, we're dealing with complexity now. Now, Ibsen is the very first modernist theater writer in some regards. So the play may not seem as complex as things that we understand now in more contemporary theater, but you have to imagine it was a break from the classic structures that you would see in, for example, a Moliere play, which is called the well-made play. Um, it was a formula. This breaks from it, and you'll see why, um, especially in the second week when we read um, the second half of the play. So I want you to really enjoy this first half and understand that it functions very typical of the plays that came before it. Um, you'll see a similar model. And obviously, it's important to recognize that before we jump into what Ibsen does that radicalizes the theater. Um, so for this week, I want you to read two things. One, the, um, obviously, the, the first part of A Doll's House. And um, that, of course, is uploaded onto your canvas. But then I would also like you to read Emile Zola's treatise on naturalism. Um, it's a relatively short article, but it's actually a criticism of, of theater, um, not in the negative sense, but just kind of talking about theater of the time and how it had to change to reflect this kind of new dynamic revolutionary culture. So it's going to be important to read that essay because you're going to, for your first discussion question, you're going to bring together or synthesize um, what Zola is saying about this new kind of acting, 
called naturalism and uh, or realism we can call it that too in the theater um, with um, the elements of the first part of a doll's house okay have a lot of fun with this um, I'd love to know your opinions on it and I look forward to the discussion have a great week y'all